Welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and I am here with my amazing co-host and sister, Rachel Smith. (laughs) Hey, welcome back, Ray. Thank you. I know Mike uh, held down the fort while I was gone. (laughs) I go out of town and you let men on this podcast. (laughs) Hey, this show is for men now. Didn't you get the memo? Yes, it's for no. everyone. <laughs> I yeah, I loved it. I thought I thought it was great. And Mike is a really great. He's a self-professed biggest fan of the Radiant Mission podcast. So that's right. I told Mike one day that someone was the biggest fan, and he's like, "Excuse me, no, I'm the biggest fan." <laughs> me i am the biggest fan of the podcast so well we missed you you went on a trip to florida to visit yeah. our family yeah. and it sounds like you had a good time yes yeah a lot of beach time in enough <laughs> to last us the year <laughs> <laughs> did you get enough of uh, vita- sun vitamin sun from well i can't even speak vitamins from the sun to yes. last you for fall and winter Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it will make it through the winter with all that gloom. <laughs> Although in Texas, our winters are like bipolar each day. Can't decide what it's going to be. So, yeah, I don't know if we've ever talked about on here where we live now, or if we, I think maybe we did earlier in the early episodes, but Rachel is in Texas and I'm in Tennessee, yeah. but we are actually from Florida. Right. So yes. we're Native yeah. Florida natives, but I guess if we not really natives if we don't live natively in Florida. Huh? Right. <laughs> I consider myself a nomad because I made them so much. <laughs> like my children were born in California. You lived in New York or Connecticut, whatever. Both. Like, yeah. 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 Both. So we've we've been all over the place. I sometimes think it has to do with our upbringing. Yeah, uh, for sure. We, we moved, moved a lot when we were kids. Yes. We moved seven times in the first seven years of my life. Yeah, And I always thought, oh, that was funny. But then by the time we moved to South Florida, when I was seven, I lived there until I went to college and then I went to college in Tallahassee. And then it mm-hmm. wasn't until after I graduated that I moved um, away. Yeah. Yeah. And now that I have kids I really, I move so much, (laughs) even more than we did as kids that I (laughs) realized that like last year that we had moved more times than the age that Everett was Oh wow! (laughs) in his life. (laughs) Like he has moved more than seven times in seven years, essentially. Yeah. Not necessarily different states, but just just moves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Although, well, he has I like- think we should also say Rachel and her husband are in real estate, so to speak, like your husband, that's what he does for work is right. he works in, um, that type of industry. And then you guys have also had investment properties and things like that, where right. you, you know, like you purchased a place and kind of, um, I don't, I don't know if flipped is the right word, but you flipped and then you rented yeah. it and moved somewhere else. And then You've done that a couple of times. So that's part of you're a real estate mogul. (laughs) (laughs) Wouldn't that be nice? No, but we really, we really, we really have come to realize that a very good way to invest money is in real estate, even if you're not going to own it for long, because especially with how crazy the market has been, you buy something, you don't get married to it, sell it in a year and you can make a bunch of money. And that's kind of just been our, is that the, are you going to write a book about that? Buy it. Don't get married to it. Sell it, make a bunch of money. (laughs) Yeah. No place we've ever lived is, um, been enticing enough for us to stay for more than a year (laughs) or maybe two. I think the longest we've lived anywhere is two years. That's so funny. Yeah. So I've moved as well, but we're on kind of a different uh, path, I would say, because we've lived here for three years. We actually just celebrated our three year anniversary of living in Tennessee and in our home the other day. Um, I know. I can't believe it's been three years already, but this is our first house that we've bought and it's great. 
And I don't, yeah. honestly, I'm the opposite of you. Cause I never want to move again. <laughs> <laughs> Just so because curious. of the moving part of moving. That's what's funny is I really feel like nobody hates moving more than me, but nobody does it more than me. <laughs> like I hate the moving part. <laughs> it's so stressful packing and doing the moving day, especially with children. It's insane. I, I don't really know what's wrong with us. When we do this. You know, I do have to say, I noticed this the last time that I visited you. I think though, that you've done a really good job of paring down your stuff that you yeah, only that really, you don't have a lot of stuff anymore. Cause like, if, if I think back to when you live, first of all, growing up, you always had a lot of clothes, but you really don't anymore. <laughs> No. Yeah. You probably had to pare that down because it's really pain to move clothes again and yes. again and again. Every and books time I and things like that. Right. Every time I move, I purge so much stuff. So yeah, I don't, maybe the next move you'll be a minimalist by then. <laughs> <laughs> when we moved from Florida to California, I got rid of almost everything that I owned that we fit everything in one tiny pod, like the smallest size pod that you can get so much so that it was packed with the little stuff we had. And the last thing that had to go in was our TV and we couldn't fit it. (laughs) We were like trying to slide it on the top of everything. And it wasn't, it was like, we had bought the TV maybe a year before. And so I was really upset because I'm like, what are we going to do with our TV? Like, and mom and dad were there helping us. And mom was so sweet. She's like, I'll buy it from you. (laughs) So mom bought it. I think it's still the TV she uses now, even though this is a long time ago. Yeah. She bought the TV from me. So I didn't have to be upset because I couldn't fit in in our tiny pod. (laughs) Oh, it's great to have uh, your parents help you, which that is kind of a running joke is mom and dad helped me with almost every single move we've done <laughs> to the point that dad is like, I'm not coming to visit you anymore. You're going to get me to help you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I forgot about that. Cause they helped you guys the last, uh, I guess like every time the last yes, two times once too. you have kids moving with kids, like you gotta have people help you because someone's got to watch the kids. <laughs> they, they're not going to help. <laughs> hey, well, one day maybe you'll hire movers. Oh, well, we actually do. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to have oh. mom and dad help us and we're hiring movers. So um, it's more about having someone to take the kids and do something while mm. Chris and I handle True. the movers and all that. But yeah, I, yeah. one of these moves in there, we have, I've taken the kids and Chris managed the movers. <laughs> so <laughs> I, well, I don't, I don't advise this life. <laughs> you don't advise this life. However, Rachel will be yeah. moving the next uh, <laughs> one to six months. <laughs> you never know <laughs> that that's uh, you never know exactly. Right. Well, we're so excited for those of you that are joining us. Thank you for joining us. If this is your first time listening in, we are on a mission to encourage and inspire others as they navigate through this life and with the relationship with Christ. We started in our couple first few episodes, specifically speaking to women and saying women in their walk with Christ and as they're navigating through life. And we actually got a number of messages and folks that reached out to us that said, the topics that you guys are talking about aren't just for women. They're for everyone. They're for all believers, especially spiritual warfare. And then even going into birth, we had folks that were like, Hey, well, um, my husband needs help (laughs) understanding what I'm going through with birth. And this is a topic for couples. This is not just about women. So we want to welcome anyone and everyone who is navigating through life basically. And just, you know, to let you know that we are faith-based. So we're approaching things from a biblical end, but we really appreciate everybody who's been listening so far. It's really been amazing to see God working and the conversations that we've been able to have with others has really been an incredible and inspiring thing since we started, uh, chit chatting over these microphones. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So today we are going to continue diving into birth 
it, this topic, you know, was a huge awakening for both of Rachel and I, for both of us in terms of the medical realm, our bodies, all of it. And Ray wasn't obviously on the last two because my husband was with me. Rachel was out of town. So I would love to start by asking Rachel, what you thought about the last two episodes of Mike and I, did you have any takeaways or anything that you feel like we missed that we should deep dive into? Um, so yeah, I thought it was really cool to hear you and Mike talk about it together. Obviously you and I have talked about your birth story for hundreds of hours. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. In different men- contexts, right. You know, cause it's like, we have right. conversations about things, but to actually tell, uh, it as a story, it is a weird thing. Cause it's hard to know. Um, there's so many details and intricacy, right. you know, like we took obviously two hours to tell that story and we could have taken like 15. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, Mike added a very interesting perspective, especially with your first birth with Brooke, mm-hmm. there were things that he experienced as the birth partner and the only person conscious. Cause you know, you had a major surgery that were put under for some of it. So just to hear that perspective, I also came away listening to it. Just, I know how much research you guys have done because we have talked about it so much, but it's really, it was really cool to hear what an expert, the two of you have come on birth and what happens with the woman's body and what is normal and, you know, just mid midwife, Mike getting his, (laughs) his, uh, his training and experience, it was cool to hear from that male perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. I I really, I I really enjoyed it. The one thing I did want to ask about is I noticed with your second birth with Ben, Mm -hmm. you mentioned not knowing how dilated you were because Mm -hmm. you never had any cervical checks Mm -hmm. the whole pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And obviously you labored at home and all that. I know you've done a lot of research on that. So I just want to see if you could tell us a little bit more of why you decided not to have cervical checks. Yes, definitely. That's a great question. And I I don't, didn't think in my life I would ever become excited to talk about cervical checks, but that was something that I learned from other people. You know, you mentioned research. One of the big things that was a great resource for me was actually Facebook groups and different Facebook groups where women from different walks of life and everybody has a different experience. So some people were, they were in home birth type of group or home birth unassisted group. So some people had free births or unassisted births. Some had home births with a midwife and a doula or one or the other. Some planned it and went to the hospital. Everybody's story is different, but there were so many women who were talking about cervical checks and how unnecessary they really are in terms of where you are in your labor progress. It's something that the medical system, and if you read Ina Mae Gaskin's guide to childbirth, you'll get a clue. That's how I got a clue (laughs) was from the way that she talked about it. But interestingly, even though in her book, she emphasizes that the body can reverse dilate, that when you basically, when you go into labor, it is a mind body connection that is occurring where the baby is ready to go. Um, They say in the medical communities, it's when the lungs are complete, the baby's ready to go. And there's just something that happens that triggers your hormones inside your body to say, let's do this. And when that connection happens, your cervix starts to dilate. Now, some people's cervix starts to dilate in the days before labor actually begins. And that's why when you go to the doctor in the weeks leading up to birth, they'll quote, check your cervix and say it's two centimeters or you're three centimeters. 
And we have been trained as a society to think that that that's an indication that, you know, we could go into labor at any moment, but really the truth is, even if you were at a one or a half, you could go into labor at any moment. Right. It's not really the best indication. The, the only indication, great indication that we have for when a baby is coming is when the baby comes. <laughs> when <laughs> to you be can honest. see the head. <laughs> yeah. When you can see the head, that's when you know that it's happening. But um, when I kind of, I don't know how to explain it, but there was just something about reading about it and then reading different women's stories of women who do not check their dilation that was when something clicked for me. And I was like, you know what, what did women do before someone else checked them before a doctor or a midwife or a nurse or whoever might be the person to quote, check dilation. What did women do? Maybe they check themselves. What did they do before that? Probably nothing. Yeah. They, no one was probably sticking their hands in there to see what was going to happen they just knew when the baby was going to come out, the baby was going to be born, you know? And I know this isn't a very uh, uh, eloquent way of saying it, but it's just kind of how I felt as I was going into it because, and if you remember my story about that doctor sticking her hand in there and swooping it around, I developed a lot of, probably you could call that trauma, like personal trauma around the idea of someone else sticking their hands in my body mm -hmm. that I was determined not to have that happen again. And I knew that even if no one did that, the baby would still be born. And so to me, it just made sense not to do it because right. if I could have trained myself and I read enough about how to check your own, um, cervical dilation that I could have done it, or I could have trained Mike to do it, but I just made the decision that I didn't want to be, um, discouraged if I checked myself and it wasn't where I wanted it or thought that it should be, or maybe I didn't check it right. You know, what if I did it? And I thought that, oh my gosh, I'm only a two. And really I was more. So I just said, you know what? I'm not going to do it at all. And yeah, guess what? He was born. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was really cool. It's almost like putting yourself on some kind of time clock, but not time. It's like measurement clock Yeah, that if you're only five centimeters, oh, the baby's not going to be here for a while. When yeah. really people go from five to baby coming out in short amount of time sometimes. So very yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's just all really amazing to think about and to hear how far you came between the two births. Uh, yeah, it totally was. And you know, too, from my story that it really was, it was one of the most discouraging moments of my entire birthing time experience with Brooke was getting checked and then them saying, Oh, you're a two or a one yeah. and a half or whatever it was. And feeling like there's no way and I am pretty confident after going through this the second time that I did reverse dilate. I feel like I was further along than I really was before I walked through those hospital doors or even got in my car, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is really um, all to say for those that are planning births and stuff like that. This may be something to consider because it is something that can affect you mentally. And when your mental state is disrupted buy these checks and things like that. And so let me just say, you can decline cervical checks. I don't know if anybody knows this, <laughs> but when you go to the doctor, because I did have uh, a VBAC doctor at the beginning of my, um, what is it called? Pregnancy, <laughs> Pre <laughs> pregnancy brain. Yeah. <laughs> still, still here. You're five months later. Um, when I was going to a doctor, you know, you don't have to change into a gown. You can stay in your clothes and say you don't want any checks and not be checked. And they'll, yeah. they'll respect that the entire time. If you, as people in the birthing community say, no is a full sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. And that speaking we... of clothes too, you don't have to change those gowns when you go to give birth either. I don't know if you know that, but, um, 
that is for some people like that do go through the practice of maybe they might stay home or whatever. Um, there's something about changing into the hospital gown that suddenly makes you into a sick patient. Yes. And so yeah. um, a lot of people won't, they'll just wear whatever it is that they want to wear, whether that yeah. is a robe or pants or a skirt or a dress, whatever it is, you know, whatever's going to, or naked. I mean, it's your birth. You right. do you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I cut you off. What were you going to say? I was just going to say that it's, we still have our rights to bodily autonomy just because yeah. we walk into a hospital room. It's and true. That's something that I definitely did not, wasn't aware of in mm -hmm. my births. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll get into that. Yeah. I didn't know about that either. And I don't, did I mention this last time, Ray? I don't recall um, that if you ever don't want something medically, you can ask them for, so let's say, um, they want to give you, you want to make sure that they don't give you something. So Pitocin, for example, I don't want Pitocin. I think I did, might have mentioned this is say, I don't want it. Please provide an AMA, which mm -hmm. stands for against medical advice. And you can sign to not, um, sign for what you want or don't want, you know? Right. Yeah. So anytime someone suggests this, and this happened to me at the dentist. I don't know if I said this on this podcast, but I went to the dentist once and I didn't want to get x-rays because I had my two children with me and they were like, put the children behind, you can put your children over here. And I'm like, I have a two month old baby. I'm not doing that. <sighs> and they were really pushing me about these x-rays. And I knew I was just getting a cleaning. I didn't need them. And so I said, um, do you have something I can sign? Because I, I'm going to all sign off. I don't, I don't need x-rays today. And sure enough, they bring out the, uh, AMA papers. So you can always, you can always advocate for yourself, but you have some very crazy stuff that happened during yours, uh, your birth with Everett. And then again, you had a C-section with both of your boys, not what you wanted, not what you planned, but things, um, went that direction. So I'm excited for you to share more of your stories and what you learned through that experience. And then what we've learned together, even through me having kids, because you had your two boys before I had my two. So you had your two. And then I had Brooke when Maverick was like two, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause you had Brooke in 20 end of 2019. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was almost two. Yeah. So to get into, um, I'll just start with Everett's birth story my births it's when I thought about telling my birth stories I'm like well Rebecca has these two contrasting births and <laughs> this like redemption I'll just kind of preface that this isn't going to be that <laughs> but as I as I thought about it it doesn't make every single mother's birth story is significant and it matters and there's so much that I had learned. It's, you know, there were powerful and traumatic and so many moments in these births that shaped me into the person I am today. So, and I also think that there is an importance of bringing awareness to mm -hmm. certain aspects of birth and the mm -hmm. medical system mm -hmm. that what I had, what I experienced is really the norm. So I do want to preface with one other thing too. And we've talked about this a little bit. If you're listening to this and you're pregnant, I might recommend not listening. <laughs> that you've talked about this concept about avoiding negative birth stories while you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that concept you, you, you said in, in your birth story about deleting old files on mm -hmm. birth mm -hmm. and programming in new files on birth when you're preparing for birth. Mm -hmm. It's not about avoiding all birth stories. It's just focusing on things that are 
empowering and positive and uplifting and the birth you want to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say this is when I was pregnant with Everett, I wanted more than anything to have a natural birth. That's something I've wanted since literally I was a teenager. And I had heard some very traumatic birth stories that were traumatizing to just like, of course, these women's birth stories mattered, but I was very advanced pregnant and literally crying and it just fed into my anxiety a lot. So I would just say, if Mm -hmm. you're someone who is pregnant and maybe is on the more anxious side, you know, maybe you want to be cautious about, Mm -hmm. um, even listening to our birth stories. I think the best time to hear birth stories is when you're already a mom or before you come become a mom, or you're Mm -hmm. just, if you're maybe you're like a couple weeks pregnant and this is the time for you to (laughs) learn what to do at, for the rest. But right. I definitely think that the end, the last, I would say four to six weeks are so important to become mentally prepared Yeah, get your that it's the not the time to be focusing on negative things. And, you know, this is something I would like to say for everybody that's listening, please, please, please. When you see a pregnant woman, do not dump yes. negative stories on her. I don't, we, we talked about this before. It's like, why do we do this? It's just a natural thing that comes out of yeah. us. But if we could reprogram ourselves to, instead of doing that, when we see someone that's pregnant say, oh my gosh, you're pregnant. That's so wonderful. This is the most exciting and wonderful time. I'm wishing you the most beautiful birth. Yes. You know, let's focus on the positive here because first of all, it doesn't have to be that way. As we know from the stories that, you know, Mike and I shared last week. I did have an amazing birth and it was such a good birth that I want to do it again. Like yeah. I left that going, this was awesome. I would, I would give birth again in a heartbeat. Yeah. But you don't really run into people that talk like that because most people go into the medical system and it doesn't support birth that way. It's not no. the same. I think all women can agree that we have, once we have our babies and everything that part of it is beautiful. And it's like, oh yeah, well, I'll go through it again because I have my babies, but not everybody. Some people have such a horrible time that then they, it does scare them away, but that's not how it has to be. And right. actually we're going to be having a guest come to speak on this podcast next week. Um, and her name is Brittany and she owns and founded a company called the biblical birth school. And she teaches people about birth and how to look at it from a biblical perspective, how to get through that, you know, those ending end part of pregnancy and birth in a beautiful way that is God filled and spirit filled. And however that might look for you, you know, not again, I'm not always here trying to push like home birth stuff, even though I personally am a huge fan. Number, number one fan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And so I'll just say, I have wanted to be a mother my whole entire life. I had all those little baby dolls as girls. (laughs) I think both of us always wanted to be moms and loved kids and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. So it's funny because in high school, my favorite show was a baby story on TLC. (laughs) I used to come home from school and watch it. And I remember one time lying on the couch watching it and mom walking by like, why do you like watching this stuff? (laughs) Because they were like showed it all. And I remember watching these women give birth in bathtubs, water births and think like, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I want that one day. So of course, when I got pregnant with Everett about seven years ago, I envisioned that that's what I wanted to do. And you start out when you get pregnant for the first time, you know, the first thing you do is find an OBJYN to call and make an ultrasound appointment. And I was living in California. And so I did that and very early on started research, researching the hospital and they do not have birthing tubs. They do not allow 
um, water births. They're actually the hospital I gave birth at, at one point in time did, but they took them all out and they didn't mm-hmm. allow water births anymore. So very early on in my pregnancy, I'm like, Oh, wait, well, that's one. Do thing. you know why they remove birthing tubs? Do you no. know why? Do you know the why behind that? No. So it's because it's inconvenient for the doctors ah, that makes because sense. they don't want you laboring in the water because they don't want you to accidentally have the baby in the water because that they are not in control. They want you laying on your hands up there. (laughs) No, they can't. They want you laying on your back on a hospital bed with your legs like, you know, so that they can be in control of the situation. And actually, so here in Tennessee, there are some hospitals that have birthing tubs that they'll allow you to labor in, but as soon as it is time for a baby to come out, they will literally physically remove you from the tub. If you will not get out, they will bring people in and lift you out and take you out because they won't let you give birth in there. Um, and I only learned this because of all the research that I was doing and the people that I talked to and the doulas in the area, they shared with me. So for anybody listening, if you're having a birth, check into what's going on in your state, talk to doulas, talk to, uh, other local moms, join Facebook mom groups, you know, learn about the options because right. while one place might not have, and honestly, even having a birth tub at all, even if they make you get out of it is better than not. I, in my opinion, just from being in one, it's great, but not everybody likes that. So, right. you know. Mom actually said that. I don't know if, if, uh, she shared that with you that they had that option when she gave birth in birthing centers, but she just Mm -hmm. didn't feel like water was right for her. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And some people don't. And that's for me, like I had seen so many water birth, you know, videos that I had in my mind. That's that, that's what I wanted to do. And Mm -hmm. so I remember early on researching. So how could I have a water birth? Mm-hmm. Cause I, the concept of a home birth was like, so over my head at this time. Mm-hmm. So I researched birthing centers, especially being that you and I were born in a birthing center. Mm-hmm. And I found some locally that did have tubs that you could water birth there. And it was about five to $6,000 for a birth. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, we were living in Los Angeles. We were what you call house poor. (laughs) We had bought our first home in LA. Our house payment was so expensive. Like we could barely afford to get by Mm -hmm. barely. Mm -hmm. And insurance did not cover the, or the birthing center didn't take insurance. Essentially. Mm-hmm. That's a whole nother thing. How insurance won't cover a birthing center with a midwife, but they will a hospital. And so we didn't have the money. So for me, it's like my insurance will cover almost all of a hospital birth. I'll just find an OBGYN that I like, and we'll do mm-hmm. it where, cause we also at that time, we're paying an exorbitant amount of money in insurance. Like it was ridiculous what our insurance cost back then. Yeah. So it's extremely frustrating to be spending over a thousand dollars a month in insurance to then just not use that. Isn't it? So so isn't it crazy too, to think, okay, so you're paying a thousand dollars a month for insurance, which ties you to having to go to a hospital when really you want to go to a birthing center, but your thousand dollar a month insurance policy isn't going to help you out there. However, I'm going to put another aside in here. (laughs) There are (laughs) medical billing companies that will and can try to help to get coverage for insurance coverage for things, but it's after the fact. And Mm -hmm. so for example, because I had a midwife, technically I could take those bills and submit them to my insurance. Sometimes insurance will actually cover some of that stuff, but it it's the place where you're going. So it's the birthing center. They don't want to deal with billing. They would rather handle cash or handle, you know, credit cards from people than have to do medical billing. So you as the patient or as the, I guess you are the patient, you know, you as the birthing mama have to then go back and try to fight your insurance company to help cover that. But I have seen women in my groups who have gotten 
money back from their insurance companies who have had home births with midwives or birthing centers or vice versa. It just all depends on the state. It all depends on the insurance company, but that is an option. And then yeah. of course you also could use your FSA to mm-hmm. pay for your doula to right. pay for, you know, any supplies or anything that you might get. But anyway, right. that's just an aside. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. I think that's great information. Unfortunately for past Rachel and past Rachel didn't know. And she didn't I, know past, any of I didn't know any of this either, but that's yes. why we want to share this now. Right. Right. And this is what is helpful about learning this kind of stuff that I did not know at mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, I'm going to go where my insurance covers. Cause that's what we're paying for. And we also didn't have like their Facebook existed back then, but it wasn't, you would have to find the exact right community to learn this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, I, I was in a ton of Facebook groups, mm-hmm. but there's, it also depends where you live. There's yeah, like, that's true. The, the culture man. in California, like even though it's called the land of fruits and nuts, <laughs> no, no offense to Californians. It's, the, it's just what people call it. It makes you, it gives this like image of like crunchy hippies. Okay. But really the system in California is incredibly medicalized. Like everything mm. is the culture. So there. Even though they say crunchy, it's like really not. Back no, crunchy. at least not in the area that I lived in. I did not find any cr- crunchy circles in Los Angeles. So <laughs> I went with an OB that was recommended. I did like her a lot. And she, I just remember liking her. She was nice. Mm-hmm. It was a woman. And so I proceeded through my pregnancy under her care. And it was in, so it was about 27, 28 weeks. I, during my ultrasounds, which I would have at least once a month, they started noting that he was breech, but it, they didn't really think it was that big of a deal because babies flip all the time. And at that time I had taken a, I started taking a birthing class. I actually got a Groupon for it. You know, <laughs> Groupon still exists. It does. <laughs> but, but I got this Groupon for this birthing class that was like once a week for a month or so that Chris and I went to. Chris is my husband for anyone who hasn't heard me say it a bunch of times, but <laughs> we went to this birthing class and it was so great. I really learned, like she educated us on the you know anatomy of birth and what happens in the mother's body. She trained partners on how to support the mothers and and I I remember sitting in the class and she was like she was actually kind of hippie. Maybe I should have talked to her more. She probably made crunchy <laughs> circles. And I remember her like saying some kind of thing of like I wish you light in your pregnancy. And I mentioned to her that my baby is breech and she just said oh. I'm so sorry. And I was like, what? I need to worry about this. Oh no. And um, she's like, I'll be sending thoughts that your baby flips. And, and at that point I started thinking like, oh, I need to look into getting this baby to flip. And and she recommended me look into spinning babies. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and I did watched a bunch of spinning babies videos on YouTube, did a ton of exercises, continued to proceed on. Now I'm getting into 33 plus weeks. And now we're having conversations with our OB of he's still breach. Like, what is the plan from here? Mm -hmm. And the options that I was given is if he does not flip by 37 or 38 weeks, we can't, we either are scheduling a C-section. That was my option. Number one, or option number two is to do what's called the external cephalic version. Is that how you pronounce it? Cephalic. I don't know. It's It's a version. ECV. Yeah. An external cephalic version, ECV. 
And essentially what that procedure is, is trying to manually flip the baby from the outside. Mm -hmm. So we started having those conversations. And in my mind, the thought of a C-section really like shook me. That wasn't anything that I had considered whatsoever. Yeah. So I went from who does, who's like, oh yeah, I'm going to get to the end of this. And then you know? Yes. Especially for me, I have two phobias in life. One is spiders. <laughs> and the second is having anything stuck into my spine. I don't, I don't even know where I would have gotten this phobia from, but the thought of a needle going into my spine, I would, w- one of the reasons I wanted a natural birth and took these classes and all that so that I could, you know, have pain management as best as I could was because the thought of something going in my spine really freaked me out. So I, and I also wanted a natural birth just because I lean that way as I am kind of a hippie. So at that point I went home and I started doing everything that I possibly could even more so to flip the baby. I remember putting ice at the top of my stomach and music at my the bottom (laughs) because people said that babies will follow music or that I, I honestly, these things probably are wives tales. Like is ice, is the baby really feeling that through? I don't know. None of it worked anyway. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, the one thing that I didn't do that I definitely wish that I did is taking chiropractic care more seriously. Mm. I had someone recommend that to me and I looked into it and our insurance wouldn't cover it. And it was like $150 per session. Mm -hmm. And again, we couldn't afford things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do wish that I would have prioritized more of these things, but to Mm -hmm. me in my mind, it's like, oh, I'm going to pay $150. And what if it doesn't, you know, that we can barely afford. And Mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, then it's just a waste of money. And so I didn't, I didn't do chiropractic care. I do want to chime in here for a second, because, um, you're mentioning things to get baby to flip and from breach, but it also is important to, for optimal position. Now, listen, babies can be born in any direction. And I think that's something that you're going to get to is what you learned later on about breach and that breach is just a variation of normal, but in certain States and in the medical system, that's not how they see it because most people are not trained to deliver breech babies. But funny enough, do you remember when I was having Ben and I wanted to prioritize chiropractic care because we had had this conversation. Yeah. He was breech when I went in for my first chiropractic appointment. Now I was, um, 28 weeks, maybe something like that. And then one chiropractic appointment, he flipped, but now my situation is different from yours, which you're going to get into a little bit more. Yeah. But a couple of things I want to throw out there for those that are listening is chiropractic care from, I honestly would recommend it third trimester, maybe second, late, later, second half, later, second trimester and beyond is where it's going to give, provide the most help. You can find places that will give you uh, great packages for prenatal, um, chiropractic care. Most places are actually around 40 to 50 bucks a session or 40 to 60, depending. So just, you know, look for somewhere great. Um, I have a, I actually happen to know, um, one of the owners of 100% chiropractic and think that they're great. I like the way that they service their customers. So that might be somewhere. If you have one of those in your area, I went to a local uh, chiropractor and he was great. And we really aligned. He was a a Christian and it was great to like go in there and listen to Christian music while I was getting adjusted. But also I was worried about posterior because Brooke was posterior. And so there were other things like leaning forward. This is actually Mm -hmm. my desk that I work at. And I made sure never to sit back. I was always leaning forward because that prevents baby from settling. They also say crawling on the floor every day. So I would literally crawl on the floor, which is easy when you have a toddler (laughs) because they're all over the floor, (laughs) crawling on the floor, uh, sleeping on your left side. I'm sure people have heard that, but not sleeping on your back. I did sleep on my back propped up with Brooke and she was totally posterior when I went into my labor time. So those are just a couple of other things, just 
position of my position, like what I did with my body, my spine, the way I sat, those weren't things that I ever thought about when I was pregnant the first time. And it sounds like you didn't either until the end. Mm -hmm. And then by that point, we've already kind of done the bad habits right. that we need to undo. So yes, this hopefully is the some kind of these stuff tips help. The, I, I have since read a lot more about this. Like you said, the uh, not leaning back very mm -hmm. as, as much as preventing as much as you can pregnant. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, sometimes the pregnant woman is going to lounge around on the couch or. Well, think crossing. about that's all you want to do, right? Is lounge. Right. But they yeah. say, don't like sit forward. Right. Yeah. And it, it and takes a lot of conscious thinking to do that. Yes. Another one is crossing your legs. And so yes. it's funny because like learning all these things in hindsight, I did all of these things. Sure. And... I did all those things too. My first time. Right. So he, <laughs> yes. So he was breach and he wasn't flipping and the weeks are creeping closer. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, having appointments every other week or every week at that point with my OB and I was like, well, we're going to do the version. I want to do everything to prevent a C-section. And so she scheduled, you have to actually check in for the hospital for that. They're essentially prepping you to do an emergency C-section because there's risks involved with the ECV. Of yes. Because you could be in moving, turning the baby, the baby could actually puncture their own sac breaking right. the water, which can lead to labor. Exactly. And that's why they, to the best of my knowledge, won't schedule it before 37 weeks. They want you full term so that the yes. baby would be yes. ready to born, be born in case it induces labor like that. And, and it also can put stress on the baby. So they, yeah. Imagine being a baby and being in there like chilling. <laughs> and then somebody yeah. comes, sticks their hands, to turn you. you around. You're like, what? Yes. The world. <laughs> yeah. So they, they put the IV in, like they're ready to go. Like it does in many ways feel like you're checking in to give birth mm -hmm. and they actually have to monitor you to make sure you're not having contractions for like an hour before. And then they start and it's incredibly painful. Some people opt not to do it just because they're afraid of it being painful. I wouldn't say though, that it wasn't anything you know, worse than anything else painful I've ever experienced. It was more like uncomfortable. Like you can't breathe because they're like crushing your lungs. <laughs> so uh, yeah, what's, what is that pleasant? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but essentially the, the, my doctor was pretty much on top of me on the bed. And I think she greased up my belly with some of that stuff. And she's, you can literally see his head. His head was always in my left rib cage and she was pushing it to the right and you could see his big bulbous head as she moved it. And she would get right to the center of my, essentially where like the ab break is. And he was just not moving past there. Like he was stuck there and she was pushing with all her strength. And at those points, it really only takes a few minutes. So to me, that's why the pain's not that bad. Cause it's just for mm -hmm. a minute or two. And then she would try again. And then she had her, uh, her practice partner come in the other doctor and he tried and she, she said a few times, I think there's something off with your uterus. I think it's something about the shape of your uterus of why he can't get past this, this this certain position. Mm -hmm. And now she did tell me beforehand that external versions, they have like 50% success rates. So mm -hmm. it really is like a roll of the dice on whether or not this is going to work. Mm -hmm. So I, I really wasn't having a lot of expectations. I was hoping. Yeah. yeah. And so when it didn't, I was disappointed, but I had already started to mentally prepare myself for a C section. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't and it kind of seem crazy that they would go through such efforts to turn a baby, but wouldn't go through the effort to simply learn how to deliver breech yes. babies? It yes. seems silly to me. Like, why would you try to move something that's clearly in a certain position for a reason in the womb? Because there, the, your baby was in that position for a reason, be, mm -hmm. like you're insinuating. And I think we already kind of gave a hint to this before, but it's like, then why not let the baby be happy how yes. they are and deliver this baby 
you know, the only dangerous position for giving birth is when a baby is transverse, which is where which is sideways. the arm comes out first. If a hand comes out, it's no good. Right. But anyway. Yes. And that, that is, that's the thing about this culture and the medical system is doctors only know what they're trained. Yeah. And unfortunately, and I did not know this at the time. But unfortunately, they are, I believe it was about 30 or so years ago that they stopped training vaginal breech births in medical schools for OBGYNs, and they started focusing on training surgeons Mm -hmm. for such an outcome as that. And OBs are then taught that the reason that they don't deliver breech vaginally is because it's too dangerous. What's very unfortunate is so much research has shown that that is not the case if someone is trained on how to properly deliver a breech baby. So with all that said, I didn't know any of this. You weren't in that position. Yeah. No, but I do remember posting about it in one of my mom groups of how disappointed I was and someone saying there are doctors who would deliver a breech baby, just go find one. Mm -hmm. And I remember like reading that and thinking like, well, how am I going to do that? at (laughs) Seven weeks pregnant. (laughs) Like, it's just very intimidating Sure. to like, what do I, like, they're telling me this is dangerous and this is my only option to have a C-section. It just really feels like I was just very resigned to listen to what I was being told instead of researching. And it is very hard to do this kind of research when you're so pregnant. It is. I, I, man, I know my, you know, midwife, um, dropped out. I was 36 weeks and yeah, it was definitely, it's, it's not, that's not the time that you want to be thinking about changing course. Right. Exactly. Yes. So I, I, we scheduled the C-section for Mm -hmm. 39 weeks. I actually was, it was scheduled for almost 40 weeks. Good. I don't even better. I don't, I think it was something to do with her schedule. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then I just remember it was almost 40 weeks because at 30, it was my next appointment after this version. So only a few days later, I had a checkup appointment and she was like concerned about my blood pressure. It was very high. Well, it was relatively high at that time. And she looked back at the record in the few days before when I was at the hospital for the version, it was a little high, but they didn't really think anything of it too much because I was there for something pretty stressful. Mm -hmm. And so she was slightly concerned about it enough that she went in and changed my C-section to be several days sooner because she's like, "Eh, I don't like the way your blood pressure is looking. And they have you scheduled at almost 40 weeks. I'm going to change this for X date. Mm -hmm. And I was due December 26th. So, so So you're like, fine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I, well, that's actually, probably, that's probably why she changed your date. Have you ever thought about that? That probably, you, yes, you, yeah. she probably had you scheduled for December 24th and was like, wait a second. I made a mistake. I'm not here. You yes. Know? I just I gotta remember make pumpkin pie. I just remember. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember the star Wars, you know, the star Wars reboot was mm-hmm. starting up back then in 2015 and the new one was coming out like this. I think it was December 20th or 21st. And I'm like, as long as it's after the Star Wars movie just comes out, because <laughs> oh we gosh. had tickets, we bought tickets months in advance to see it. So I was like, I just want to be able to see that before we had the baby or oh, whatever. That's so funny. So we, she was a little concerned about my blood pressure though. And so and you were like, concerned about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what I was concerned about. So I, she told me, I want you on your way home, stop at the drugstore and get a blood pressure cuff. And I want you to measure your blood pressure two or three times a day. 
And if it gets above this number and she wrote it on a piece of paper, I don't remember what the number is now off the top of my head, but she wrote this number on the paper and she said, if it gets above this number, I want you to call me. And I said, okay. And so we went about our day, we went shopping, we, you know, did what she said and got this thing. And I do remember at this time too, I was very, very swollen. I was very uncomfortable this late in pregnancy. I gained like 60, 65 pounds. It was like a whale. And I, we went home and we were just laying around relaxing and we were watching one of the last Harry Potter movies. And I think it was the last one. It's funny to me to hear that you're watching Harry Potter since you don't watch that now. I know (laughs) I'm such a different person now, as I've shared some of my testimony here and there, this was the point in my life that I did not, I was not walking with the Lord and I lived very differently. I don't, I'm sure I prayed here and there throughout these issues, but I was in no way, shape or form dependent on the Lord to get through this birth or what was Mm -hmm. going on with me so we're watching one of the last harry potter movies and the only reason i even bring this up is because while we're watching it i open up the blood oh my gosh you're gonna take your blood pressure now what a terrible idea (laughs) yes and i i check my blood pressure and it is so much higher than the number on the paper (laughs) Like, yeah, I wonder why (laughs) to the point that I was like, oh, maybe I'm not using this thing. Right. And then we kind of look at the instructions and put it on the other arm and it's still the same. And then we're like, maybe something's wrong with it. So we took Chris's blood pressure and his was within normal range. It wasn't the same number. So then I'm like, maybe I'm just stressed out from this movie. (laughs) Yeah, really turned it off. And we, I just, uh, I just like laid for a few minutes, took it again, still super high. So I'm like, okay, I guess I need to call her. Like it's not going down. So I call her and I don't know what I thought was going to happen. I think what I thought is that she would just like tell me to relax or give me a medication or something. I didn't have any idea what, why blood pressure really mattered in pregnancy. And so I told her that we checked it multiple times and this was what the number was. And she was very calm and she said, okay, so here's what I want you to do. You know, there's nothing you need to worry about. I want you to just go get some of your things together. Make sure you have a bag and we're going to have this baby tonight. And I'm like, what? (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) Why? (laughs) And I start crying and I'm freaking out. I'm like, I'm not ready to have this baby. Like my house was a mess. I really wanted to have like clean my whole house before bringing a baby home. Yeah. Some nester, your house was yeah. clean. <laughs> and so I'm asking her and so she's, yeah, I know. I, I was not a nester for sure. I was very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so she, uh, while I'm on the phone and Chris just looks panicked and starts rushing around, installing the car seat while I'm on the phone, I hang up with her. I call <laughs> mom hysterically crying. Like I'm not ready to have this baby. I can't do this. Mom gave me some kind of pep talk. And then I, um, I calmed down and I just went and I got in the shower and started shaving my legs for the first time in six months. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, I remember I was taking my sweet time and Chris comes in and he's like, don't we have to go? Like it sounded serious. And I'm like, we will go when we go. I really relate to that episode of the office. You know, when Pam goes into labor and she's like panicking about like, I'm not ready to have this baby. <laughs> I can't have this baby. Like we will go when we go. And so I, I was very much feeling that of, I wasn't I wasn't ready. And, and I was scared. I didn't want to have this C-section. I was really Mm -hmm. scared. Mm -hmm. So we, we got it together and we dropped our dogs off at my really good friend's house. And they took the final picture of us before we became parents. And we checked into the hospital and this was in the evening by now. 
and they started checking my blood pressure and it wasn't as high anymore. It was like borderline, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't that high. Mm -hmm. And so what they explained is that she said her concern is that I am borderline preeclampsia. And she'd been concerned about that a bit for a few weeks based on my urine. I didn't really have much protein in my urine, but it was a little questionable. And then my swelling and my blood pressure indicated that I was essentially on my way to preeclampsia. So she, the, essentially what they say is the treatment for preeclampsia is delivery because Mm. my understanding is it's the placenta starts. I don't know the medical term, but it starts causing issues and what the risk is, is to the mother that you very advanced preeclampsia, it starts causing you to have seizures. So she wants, because I was almost 38 weeks at this point, she wanted to just go ahead and get him out so that this didn't develop into full-fledged preeclampsia. So I was like, okay, And this is just what's so interesting about the difference in being an educated mother and someone who has no idea what's going on is you just, everything is just, you're being led and it it really didn't feel like I ever made any decisions for myself, Yeah, but I was told what I needed to do that was best for me and the baby. And I just did it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying necessarily that that was wrong in that circumstance. I don't really know in hindsight, it was just my perspective at the time. I have a question. Did when your doctor suspected preeclampsia potentially, did she recommend any changes in your diet? Mm -mm. She recommended me to come in and have the baby. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's the thing is that preeclampsia can be managed through food. Yes. And really not eating certain things. Yes. Being and very I was, clean about what you're eating, yes. taking the right types of supplements and minerals. Right. I was in, I was very unhealthy in pregnancy too. I was, I ate more junk than nutritious foods. So I, I, I really see why it makes sense that diet plays such a huge role. Mm-hmm. So we, we, she was able it wasn't as advanced enough that she wanted us to have the, for me to be monitored overnight and schedule the C-section for the next morning. Mm. And so we stayed that night and labor and delivery without a baby. And I remember hearing all the babies being born and all night, like crying. Like that's when I determined newborn babies have two different cries. They either sound like cats or dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> so yeah, it was like, you know, when you're going into a planned C-section, like I was for a breech birth, you expect to kind of have, you know, maybe anxious night's sleep the night before, but at least comfortable sleep in your own bed. And instead we're in a hospital room. Mm. And so we, um, had the surgery set up for the next morning. The next morning we got up and they prepped me and we started walking to the OR. And I remember they said for Chris to stay outside and I was going to go in by myself. And there's a lot of things that you don't really find out until in the moment, like nobody kind of mentally preps you for. And that's the part I was having the most anxiety about Cause they said he had to stay outside for the spinal, mm. which is which, the part you are the most. Exactly. That's the part about. I was having the most anxiety about. And so they, I was like, he can't come in with me. And they're like, no, for, I don't know. It's like keeping it sterile, which is I don't, ridiculous. I don't know why the, the partner can't be there to support them, but I did have a nice nurse and she like one nurse was like the nurse was holding me and helping me breathe through it as the anesthesiologist. Maybe it's because the husbands pass out when they see this. (laughs) Maybe (laughs) it's, um, yeah, it, 
it was very unpleasant. And I will say, um, the one thing that I, I, you know, could kind of understand from your prep with, with your second birth is I had read the hypno babies book when I was early in my pregnancy and Mm -hmm. preparing for this natural birth that I now wasn't getting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take all the class like you did. I just read the book. So I had or listen to the audios. Right. I had just read about the breathing technique of Mm -hmm. like a certain amount of breaths in and holding it and breaths out. And I used that to -hmm. help with my, because I have a history of anxiety and panic attacks. And so while I'm having this spinal done, I felt like I was going to have a panic attack. So I was using those breathing techniques and it really did help me to just keep calm. Good. So they, you know, place this, the spinal, and then they kind of rush you to lay down. And it is just so surreal having a C-section. Like it's like, (laughs) it's like an out of body experience of like, how is this happening? Like it's, it's, it's just wild. And finally, when Chris came in the room, I felt so relieved and just having your partner there, whatever kind of birth you're having is they play such a huge role in our mental Mm -hmm. space. It's a support system. Right. Yes, exactly. And I was also given the opportunity in this birth, given the opportunity because (laughs) the hospital makes all the rules. (laughs) I'm like a prisoner talking about how my <laughs> overlords treated me. I'm just kidding. You're not but though, they, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. They allowed two people in the OR. Woo-hoo. So my best friend, Lindsay was in there, came in with Chris and she kind of stayed back and was taking pictures and videos mm-hmm. while Chris held my hand mm-hmm. and because I, they couldn't both be at my head. There was enough room. There's like so many doctors and nurses in there. And so I just watched Chris's face to, and continued that breathing the whole time. And I remember his eyes getting really big. And I was like, <laughs> I wanted to say to him, stop looking like that because it was freaking me out <laughs> the face he was making. And he was making that face at the point that they were pulling his body out. Oh my gosh. And it was just like, I was watching the birth of our son through Chris's eyes. <laughs> and it was, it, it, and it was freaky too about a C-section is yeah, you're numb to the pain, but you can feel everything. And so they pulled him out and they put him under the curtain and they let me have skin to skin. Let me again, Mm -hmm. have skin to skin immediately. And it was amazing. And it was beautiful. And I just remember hearing Lindsay's voice crying, saying he's the most beautiful baby I've ever seen. (laughs) That's so funny. And she, was she still pregnant at this time or she, yes, had- she, she was due with her first son a month later. Okay. So yeah, actually it was I knew probably about super close. Like that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, she was very pregnant. And so it, it was great to have her in there because then what happened is they let me hold him for a few minutes and it's very cold in an OR. And then they took him to the warmer to clean him off. And that's when Chris cut the cord and everything. And at that time she came over and stood by my head. And that was really huge because it is very, it's very, very hard to be so disconnected from your birth and to Mm. feel like you are not a participant in it. It's just happening to you. And it was really, that was really special to me that I had someone who was focused on me still. Cause I wanted Chris to go with our son. Of course, someone should be with the baby, but then otherwise I would have been left alone, but she came over and she was like showing me the pictures and videos of him at the warmer. And we were talking about how crazy it was and it was, but then it was just so exciting. And it was, it was, it, it was honestly the best experience I think that you could really have with a Mm C-section. We had a good group of people in the room. I remember the anesthesiologist and my OB kind of cracking jokes about the star Wars movie um, (laughs) that we were not able to see. And uh, so it was, 
it, it was a good atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And then I remember the, so they have to do a bunch of stuff, as you know, after the baby comes out to clean out your uterus and put all your organs back together. And so you back up. And I remember the, my OB saying to me, well, and this is from the other side of the curtain. So I can't see her. I just hear her voice say, well, I know why he was breech. You have two uteruses in here. And I'm just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and I literally just thought it was like, I was high from all the drugs that <laughs> I did not know what she was talking about. I could not conceive what she was talking about. Uh-huh. And she said, I'll go through it with you later when you're in recovery. And I was like, okay. And so we, we get me all put back together and I was rolled out of the OR holding Everett and as happy as could be and as swollen as could be. I look like Shrek. Like (laughs) I did not realize how much more you could swell once they pump you full of tons of fluids. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it was a pretty uncomplicated breach cesarean. And then later in after a recovery. And once I was in my room, she came and explained to me what she meant in the crazy thing that she said, that she said that I have something called uterus didaphis, that essentially that I've had this my whole life since I formed in my mother's womb, that my uterus didn't there's a septum that can go through the center and mine fused together forming two uteruses. And for some women who have uterus didaphis, they can have two uteruses, two cervix, two vaginas. And she would determine in later examinations at what degree mine was, but all she could see is that I had two uteruses. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason he was breached from pretty early on and never flipped again, because he had half the space as Mm -hmm. a typical uterus. And, and then we were like, what, this is crazy. (laughs) We'd never heard of anything like this in our life. We then did a bunch of research. Apparently women with uterus didaphis can even get pregnant in both uteruses at the same time. And the babies have like different birth dates. Like yeah. Cause they're apart. technically not twins. Yes. It's so crazy. So, so it, crazy. it was, it was wild to learn that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we then confirmed later that I didn't have two cervixes or two vaginas. I'm sorry if that's TMI, but this is just <laughs> the way that bodies <laughs> are sometimes it's yeah. a variation of normal too, just like breach is a variation of normal in birth so is our anatomy and how we form. And I guess essentially it is a disformation of a uterus. It's less than 2% of women have a, um, I want to say a a differing shape uterus because they're not all uterus didaphis. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much concludes the you know, my, my birth with Everett, it, like I said, I think it was really the best C-section experience it could have. It was very medicalized birth. I did struggle. I'm not going to get into the detail a, a ton. Cause I'm really just focusing on birth stories here. I did struggle a lot with breastfeeding him after. And that was a very hard, honestly, it was funny because after the surgery and people come and visit or check in on me, how is the C-section incision? How are you healing? Are you in a lot of pain? And I'm like, I couldn't even notice that if I wanted to, because breastfeeding was so painful for me. (laughs) Yeah. You had a really hard time. Mm -hmm. That was what was painful to me was breastfeeding. So recovery, you know, well, I was a lot more focused on that. And it was just a difficult time in general because this birth happened sooner than I had anticipated about a week and a half sooner that we, we didn't have really help there. You know, we just became parents and mom was, cause we lived in California and everyone was in Florida. Mom was planning to come to help us 
and had already booked her flights for like three weeks later when our original scheduled C-section was so, Mm -hmm. or maybe it was two weeks later. So it was, it was, it was tough recovery, but Mm -hmm. we got through it. So that concludes Everett's birth story without getting into the details of postpartum, because that's a whole nother adventure and a mm-hmm. topic I'm sure mm-hmm. we'll cover one day. We got to yeah. have a whole episode dedicated to breastfeeding. Uh, that's a good idea. We could yes. get a lactation consultant on. Yes, I would love that. So I have a ton to share about my second birth story with Maverick that a lot of things go similarly, but they're so that it, it's, it's essentially my, my trauma birth with Maverick, my mm-hmm. second son. So we're going to hold off on that one until next week and conclude here today. So unless there's anything else you want to. Yeah, add. I think, thank you, first of all, for being open to sharing both your birth stories and your postpartum stories. I hope that these stories help other women as they're mm-hmm. navigating, whether they've had, you know, you've had babies or not. I think it can be helpful to kind of hear different perspectives and to learn and just to become empowered to over time and uh, all that kind of stuff. I am glad to hear also a positive C-section story because not all C-sections are terrible. I think that it helped that in some ways it helped that you were scheduled and that it wasn't something that happened in the moment. Yeah. Um, but I also do think that there's things that we can all take away from breach as right. a concept. Now we finally get to conclude your breach situ- scenario was different. And that was why that right. version really didn't do anything because there was no way that he could have turned in that small space. Right. So it was cool that you got an answer for that, but yes. thank you for telling your story. And I can't wait to chat more about Maverick's story on the next one. Cause that was certainly a wild time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's I, I do. I do think hearing positive C-sections is, is it's important too. Yeah. And like I said, this was not the birth that I had ever imagined, but I never imagined having two uteruses. And I don't think <laughs> yeah. anybody imagines that for themselves. So Much there, a shock. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There are so many lessons that I learned from that though. And I was very, I was very happy to have the experience went better than I thought it would was going to. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So to close today, I wanted to close us with Proverbs three, five through eight, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. We're wishing you all a radiant week. Thank you for listening.